thank you for thank you for uh, attending our uh, business session and uh, Dr. Shapiro is uh, with us now and uh, if we get started uh, that'll just give us a little more time uh, later to ask uh, questions so uh, if you don't mind uh, Dr. Shapiro uh, Carl I'll give a, a little introduction. Uh, Dr. Robert Shapiro got his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1982, is the Wallace S. Sayre Professor of Government and International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He is former chair of the Department of Political Science at Columbia, and he served as acting director of Columbia's Institute for Social and Economic and Economic Research and Policy, ISERP, during 2008 to 2009. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He received the Distinguished Columbia Faculty Award in 2012 and 2010, the Outstanding <laughs> Achievement Award of the New York Chapter of the American Association for Public Opinion Research. He specializes in American politics with research and teaching interests in public opinion, policymaking, political leadership, and the mass media and applications of statistical methods. He has taught at Columbia since 1982 after receiving his degree and serving as a study director at the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. Professor Shapiro is co-author of The Rational Public 50 Years of Trends in America's Americans' Policy Preferences and Politicians Don't Pander, Political Manipulation and the Loss of Democratic Responsiveness. His most recent books are Presidential Selection and American Democracy, The Oxford Handbook of American Public Opinion and the Media, and Selling Fear. Uh, Counterterrorism, the Media and Public Opinion. He is the co also a co author or co editor of several other books and has published numerous articles in major academic journals. He is currently the president of the, Amer of the Academy of Political Science, the editor of Political Science Quarterly, and chair of the board of directors of the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research. His current research examines partisan polarization and ideological politics in the United States, as well as other topics concerned with public opinion and policy making. Dr. Shapiro, welcome. Okay, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I see you have over 50 participants here, so that's, that's very impressive. So I'm speaking to a, a big crowd. Um, kind of look, looking at the crowd, I have a couple thoughts. One is, especially given that you invited me, I suspect I'm talking to an audience of political junkies, although you may have been, you may be worn out by this time with the election, which has, which has gone on for, which has gone on for a very long time. Also, given the, uh, how, do, how do I put it, a generational profile of, of the group here, uh, th there's a lot of political history that we share. So I, so I can make references to things that you, that you know about in contrast to making references to things like presidents, you know, before Jimmy Carter, where my, my undergraduate students in particular will uh, you kind of stare blankly at historical references, you know, pri prior to that. Well, actually, even as far back as, uh, you know, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, and uh, George H.W. George Bush and, and Jimmy Carter um, as well. Um, you know, given how long the, the, the election's gone on, I, I, I also wonder how much I can tell you that's, that's new that you haven't thought about and, uh, and, and, and so forth. And I have, I have a couple you know, points I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to make. And I, I, can, I can say things more quickly or slowly, depending on how interested you are in turning this more into a question and answer discussion session uh, as well. And I'll let the, uh, the person chairing the, the meeting kind of uh, you know, decide that. Well, that before you begin, uh, Bob, uh, that'll be up to you. I mean, uh, we can have people raise their hand and uh, be addressed, or we can hold the questions uh, till your presentation is complete and then uh, do it that way. So uh, I'd leave that up to you. 
which is your preference? Okay, well, let, let's do this. Let, let me aim to speak um, you know, a, a little shorter rather than longer, and then we'll, then we'll get to the question. So just hold, let me just make you know, cer you know, cer certain points uh, that, that I, that I want to make. One, Fantastic. One, Great. Okay. Uh, one point I want to make is um, we need to put the current election into recent historical uh, perspective. Even without Donald Trump as president, American, the, the current state of American politics would be very conflictual, partisan, bitter, um, even, you know, even if, if Trump weren't president. Trump has added a diff different layer to it in terms of affecting the civility or incivility of, um, of American politics. But that, that's, that's more style than, than ideological substance, I, I think. There are, two, there are two things to keep in mind. Now, now you all actually have this perspective. There was a time, go back to the 1950s, American partisan politics was, was not as sharp and ideological as it is today. The Democratic Party was an uneasy coalition of Northern liberals and Southern conservatives. And the conservative element tended to moderate, moderate the party. And, and it was moderated by virtue of the fact that the issue of race relations and civil rights tended to be kept off the, 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 the political agenda. At the same time, the Republican Party was a mix of, of um, leaders that were conservative on economic issues, regulation, labor issues, but were more moderate and even liberal on rights and civil rights issues. The, the Republican Party back then, you know, in, the, in the first half of the, of the 20th century, was, was still in effect, um, the, or ostensibly, the party of Abraham Lincoln. That is, and, and there, were, there, were, there were a great many particularly um, you know, moderates or liberals in the Northeast. I can throw out names that I think you've heard of. My, my students would not have heard of them. You know, Nelson Rockefeller, Jacob Javits, Charles Percy, uh, um, uh, Clifford Case. Clifford Case is my favorite, is a favorite of mine in, in New Jersey. In the, in the first election in which I voted, which was um, 1972, uh, uh, where I was eligible to vote thanks to the uh, new amendment to the constitution, I voted for George McGovern for president. I vote, or, you know, a li very liberal out there Democrat. And I, I voted for Clifford Case, a Republican, who was, you know, who, who was the identifiable, you know, liberal progressive type candidate of that day. Uh, you, you, you see far less of that kind of, that, that kind of thing today in, in, in American politics. It all started to change. And, and here, if you want to point fingers, you know, point the fingers at the Democratic Party, Northern Wing of the Party, Lyndon Johnson. The Democratic Party, long story short, after World War II, civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, and so forth. Uh, the Northern wing of the party was on the ascendancy and Lin Lyndon Johnson climbed on board as well and became the, you know, the, the pro-civil rights president, 1964 Civil Rights Act, and then the, uh, the um, you know, which really uh, upset the South uh, in the, within the party enormously followed by, and this broke the camel's back, so to speak, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, and you know, at, at that point, Southerners in the party did not feel at home there. Uh, they left the party. Uh, congressional districts in the South that had had Southern conservatives, depending on the profile of the district, especially with the Civil Rights Act of, this, of, of the Voting Rights Act of 65, right when African-Americans uh, voted, those districts could be you know, replaced by more liberal um, Democrats in the South. So, so the Democratic Party became not only liberal on New Deal type economic welfare issues uh, and labor issues, but also, also liberal on when it came to civil rights issues. And as other new issues came along, having to do with rights and liberties, having to do with the environment, abortion, gay rights, I mean, just you, you name it, they, 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 they through intra in, with internal party competition became the liberal party on all those kinds of issues. And then and, and the Republican Party, you know, uh, beginning with Richard Nixon's Southern strategy became the, uh, less, the party less supportive of civil rights issues, the more conservative party on, on those issues. Um, the Republican Party had been not only, you know, not only the, uh, not only the support, supporters of civil rights, but also women's rights as well. The Equal Rights Amendment came out of the, the Republican Party. And then as other rights issues came up, abortion and so forth, through internal party competition and, and the ascendancy of evan evangelicals and, and religious conservatives in the party, they became conservative on issues like abortion. I mean, case in point, in 1972-73, at the time of Roe Ro versus Wade, 
there was hardly any difference between Democrats and Republicans at the level of political leaders and at the level of voters uh, in their attitudes toward the toward abortion. And if and if anything, the you know, Republicans were more pro were more pro choice than uh, than than Democrats were. All right, so, and, and so so the parties you know basically diverged on on all these issues that on on all these old issues and, and new issues. And then on top of that. Uh, as some of you may remember, um, the, par the parties became more competitive for control of the Senate and the House of Representatives through much of the 20th century. Uh, of, of course, the, the, the presidency bounced back between the, between the parties, but the House and the Senate, for the most part, stayed in Democratic hands. So it was possible for a Democratic president to have what we call unified Democratic government where a Democrat was president and the Democrats controlled the House and the Senate, and thereby the courts as well through, through, through court appointments. But the Republicans typically were more likely to be faced with divided government. Now that changed sharply beginning in 1980, where on Ronald Reagan's coattails in the 1980 election, the Republicans took the Senate and thereafter became competitive for control of the Senate. Fast forward to 1994, Bill Clinton's midterm election uh, you know, fiasco, the Republicans, led by Newt Gingrich, took control of the House of Representatives and thereafter became um, competitive for the House. So it was possible now to have either unified Republican government or unified Democratic government, where the, where, where, where the parties were basically unified in terms of having, in the case of Republicans, a conservative political agenda and the Democrats a liberal political agenda, which meant um, that elections mattered. And you know Ronald Reagan, and not Ronald Reagan, um, uh, Donald Trump, in the first debate when he was when, when he was asked about the, the court appointments, you know, asserted correctly that elections matter, and uh, and the, the current debate about the Supreme Court nomination is, is, is directly related to that. Well, they do matter with unified Republican government. You can have a, a shift in policy in a conservative direction, and with a Democrat, you can move in a liberal direction. And we and we saw it. Barack Obama, with his decisive victory in two thousand eight. Uh, not only won the presidency and thereafter could, you know, promote, you know, very liberal policies. Uh, the uh, the crowning jewel of which was perhaps the Affordable Care Act, um, which he needed uh, strong support in, in Congress from Democrats there to pass. In fact, he needed a filibuster-proof Senate for a brief period. For a very brief period, the Democrats had 60 votes in the Senate until until Scott Brown uh, cap, uh, captured uh, Ted, Ted Kennedy's seat. And and then and and and, and then uh, and then prior to that, when George you know, W. Bush was 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 elected in, in 2000, he had he had a you know, he had um, a Republican Congress and was able to push a conservative policy through. And then you know, Donald Trump gets elected uh, with control of the House and, and the Senate, and is and is able to uh, you know with the help of Mitch McConnell um, re relaxing a filibuster bill in the case of Supreme Court appointments, um, is able to to, to pass. Uh, well, to pass tax reform, engage in, in deregulation in terms of policy making, and make conservative judicial appointments, and that any Republican president would have done. This wasn't. This, this wasn't. You know, I mean, Donald Trump gets credit for it because he won the election, but any Republican who won the election would have been able would have, would have been able to get those kinds of things. So the so the elections matter. They're very close and very competitive for control of government, and it's and because of those consequences, it really has raised the temperature. The emotional level of elections and and politics, where there's more anger in politics, and political psychologists who have studied this, that when you, when, you, when 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 politics gets pretty emotional, it begins to affect not only it's not only related to, to to individuals and leaders' positions on issues, but it's affected how they at least perceive either per perceive political realities or report how they perceive political realities. And just to make a long story short, it kind of explains why um, you know we live in an, an ideological state of politics, uh, and also a state of politics where the where partisans, Democrats and Republicans, seem, seem to reside in two different, two different worlds, or, or at least you know, say they see things differently. Uh, on the perceptions of the economy, perceptions of climate change, um, you, know, you name it. Um, and and, and, then, and then, 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 of course, it's the, you know, the acceptance of, by Republicans, <laughs> Donald, at least Trump's base, of his uh, um, difficulty with truth and, and facts. So to speak. So that, so that that's basically the setting for for current politics. Now, in in, ter in terms of the election itself, 
now we 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 can we can talk about you know where 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 things you know current currently stand. I took a look at the the uh, the polls this the, the latest trends in the polls this morning, and the polls really are are, are pretty striking in terms of the, the lead that Biden has in the national polls, but more importantly, he's had steady leads in um, support in all the key battleground states. And of course, you know we're talking about an election that's not really national. It's only national to the extent that if his lead in the national polls is so big. It means that he's he's going to he's going to win enough states to win the electoral college, but it's the it's the polling on uh, in, in the individual states that matter that matter the most. And he's been you know, pretty steadily ahead in the key battleground states. And the ones the real key ones are Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, that the Democrats have to take back if they want to win the election or or, or, ca or capture some states they haven't um, gotten in a in in a very long time. All right. So, so what I so what, so what I want to do is I want to I want to look at the electoral map, but I want to but I want to show you just a brief history of the electoral map in terms of how how we got to where we are, kind of talking about a, you know a particular small number of states. And there have been some certain changes that have, that have occurred that are that are worth pointing out, and and also the the way the, the way the way in which the electoral map has changed from one in which the Democrats used to, used to win all the Southern states to a point where the, where the Republicans now have as their base, um, you know, virtually all the, the Southern states. So what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna go through some of, the, some of the electoral maps. So I wanna share a screen and I have some slides for you. Okay. Okay, so what, what, I what I have here are, are some slides. Um, what's going on? Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm assuming, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you can see the slides as the, the, elect the election arithmetic? Yes. You all see that? Okay, good, because I, I, don't, I don't see your, your, your camera pictures anymore. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking from my slides here. All right, so I, 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 don't, I don't mean to give a high school civics lesson here, but I just wanna, just wanna review quickly so we're on the, uh, on the same screen. Um, there's a difference between the general election, national vote, and the electoral vote. Um, and I wanna show you what the, what the um, electoral college map has looked like since 1992. Um, and and I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna point to, I wanna talk about the blue wall, and I wanna talk about um, states that have gone back and forth and why it is we're focusing on, on, on particular states. All right, so you, you all know that the number of electoral vote each state has is equal to the number of senators and house members and the district of columbia has three electoral votes uh which which they would have if they were a state with two senators and one and one um, um house member. okay and then uh, and then the, then the candidate with the majority of the electoral vote the magic number is, is, is 270 um if for reason if for any reason there's no winner the elect the, the selection goes to the house of representatives and and the senate we can talk if you want about the electoral college and its original intent and the problems with it or whatever, but let's let's just get to the electoral map. Okay, now this, this is this is this is 1992, and this this is a this is an electoral map that we probably won't see again. This was the the, the big victory of Bill Clinton. Um, he he defeated uh, George H. Bush. Um, Clinton was was the Democratic candidate who basically took the chance of challenging. Um, George H. Bush, uh, beginning during a period when his popularity was an all at an all-time high because of uh, the success of the United States in the in, in the in the first Gulf in the first Gulf War, uh, but the but the but the memory of the war kind of dissipated and the election focused on the economy and the and the James Carville slogan for the campaign was it's the economy stupid, and uh, to make a long story short, Bill, you know, Bill Clinton won a you know sizable um, victory of landmark proportions. And what we see here is we see a lot of blue. We see a lot of blue states. The blue states are the, are the Democratic states, and the red states are the, are, are the Republican states. And I don't, I don't think we're going to see this again. But at, you know, with, at this point, we can begin talking about the idea of this. They, they talk about this blue wall. Now, when I hear the phrase "the blue wall," first heard the phrase "the blue wall," I'm trying, trying to figure out what's the blue wall. I'm looking for a wall here. Well, there there are there are blue walls. There's the, the there's the West Coast wall. You know, Washington, Oregon, Nevada, and uh, and, and, and California, with Nevada necess not necessarily being a reliable democratic state. And then and this election is really peculiar. There's, there's, there's a wall down the middle of the, of the United States that goes from the, 
the upper, you know, the, the, the eastern Midwest to the, to the south, where, where you have southern states captured by Jim, Jimmy Carter, including, including his home state of Arkansas and Louisiana and Georgia and Tennessee um, uh, as, as well. And then the, the, the blue wall, as it's commonly referred to, is really the Midwest wall, Minnesota, Wisconsin, include Illinois there, Michigan, um, Ohio iffy, but Pennsylvania very important. And then there's the East Coast wall here. So maybe there's a wall going, going from the Midwest to the, uh, to, to the, to, to the, to the, to the Northeast. And the states, the th th things to watch here, and there's been, there's been a change that really affects the electoral map in a way that enables the Democrats to win with a, a surprisingly few number of, few number of states. I'm going to switch maps, but watch what happens to Colorado and Virginia. Bill Clinton won, won Colorado, which was not always, it, was, it wasn't really thought of as, as, a, as a democratic state. Nevada and New Mexico were thought of as competitive for the, the Democrats. And then, the, and then these, these southern states, given the changes in politics, became much more difficult for the, uh, the Democrats. And then, of course, there's Florida. And then Ohio went Democratic, which is um, not an obvious kind of thing. And then Florida is Republican, which is not necessarily an obvious kind of thing. So that, that's 1992. Let's jump, let's just jump ahead to 1996. Okay, so Clinton does a little bit, um, he do, do, does comparably well there. Notice that Colorado goes from blue, goes from blue to red. Um, Iowa is, um, actually, what was Iowa in the previous? Iowa was, was Democratic, and it's Democratic in, in, in 1996. Uh, Ohio stays Democratic. Florida becomes democratic and, and, and Clinton has a major victory. The economy's picked up. The scan, there's a scandal going on as you, as you all know, but he's being, basically being rewarded for the, uh, the pickup of the economy. And he's still able to win some Southern states. He's a, he's a good uh, sub, su southern, southern boy, uh, so to speak. And, he, and he's, picked, he's picked up Kentucky and West Virginia as well, which is another oddity for the, uh, for, for the Democrats. Okay. so. Solidly democratic, and then th this is where the electoral map really changes, and this is where we really see the Republican ascendancy in the South. Notice here, you know, you know, basically the Republicans, you know, win the entire South. I guess it depends on how you want to count New Mexico. They also win Nevada uh, as well. Okay, that that's significant. Everybody's focusing on Florida because of the dimple chads and the, the election goes to the Supreme Court and all of that stuff. But notice that Colorado and Virginia are also Republican as well. And, and uh, you know, the Electoral College vote is very close, 271 to 266. And everybody's focusing on Florida and the count, but, the, but there, you know, there are a lot of other, I don't know if oddities, just simple facts here. If Gore had won his home state, everybody laments. He had he won Tennessee, he would have won the election, 11 votes for Tennessee. Had he won New Hampshire, which Clinton had won consistently, he would have won the election. Had he won Nevada, he would have won won the election. So and then, and then Ohio, which which Clinton won twice, you know, went, went went Republican as well. But what's really striking here is that it's a this is a close election, but the Democrats can do very well with not an enormous number of states. But they're they're getting the big states. They're getting New York. They're getting Pennsylvania. They're getting California. And and of course, the number of electoral votes that New York and Pennsylvania has starts to drop because of migration. And then Texas is, you know, has been has been on the rise, as has been Florida as well. But 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 but, th but this really shows you how closely competitive the parties are for the um, the electoral college the electoral college college vote, and and also the also the national vote as, as well, because Gore, as you know, won the you know won, won the won the popular vote by a, a small margin. Jump ahead to two thousand four. You know, again, and this is this is after 9/11 and uh, and so forth. You know, the South is fully solidly Republican, including Nevada and New Mexico here, and you know, and and, and Virginia, and and this and this is where you you see you see the blue wall in play. The gap between the parties in the electoral vote is 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 is, is um well is, is is 35 votes, and for the Democrats to to go from 251. To 270 um, basically just requires well it requires a state or two. That is, had the Democrats won um, Ohio in uh, in 2004, they would have had 270, 271 electoral votes. So, so that shows you how close it is. Even though the map is really predominant is really predominantly red. 
Jump ahead to 2008. This is this is the um, you know, fiasco for the Republicans. But here here you get now. This is where you get a real good sense of where of where the comp, where the competition is. And I, I want to just I just want to jump back one slide again. Sorry about that. Iowa here is um, seven electoral votes is is, is Republican. Uh, and New Hampshire is uh, um, goes de goes Democratic in 2004. The Democrats are able to get New Hampshire, but they've lost other states. So they're not competitive. So they're not competitive. 2008, okay, so there are a lot of things going on here. And this basically kind of sets the stage where, you know, where, 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 the, where the deadlock is, where the close competition is. Nevada and New Mexico have, have looks like they're, they're becoming, if not to become, Democratic states. Colorado and Virginia now are Democratic states. And they're going to they're gonna stay that way, as are Nevada and, and New Mexico. Iowa, Iowa becomes um, a Democratic. New Hampshire stays Democratic, and then the and, and, and then and then the blue wall here is in, is intact. In the Indiana and Ohio, the, the, um, Indiana in particular is an oddity. That is that that's a Republican state that goes that goes Democratic. Um, Ohio goes Democratic. North Carolina, a Southern state, and Florida become Democratic. But these but these are really these, these really clearly become swing states as do as do as do Ohio. Iowa as well has, been, has, has bounced around. But the solid states here are Minnesota, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the wall, folks, in, in Illinois. That, that has to hold in order for the Democrats to win. That, if that crumbles, you know, basically all bets, all bets are off. And all the pundits and you know, professors, me included, just sort of have, have taken uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania you know, for granted. Jump ahead to 2012. Uh, Obama does a little bit less well, but wins, but wins, wins decisively there. Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, Virginia have become Democratic states. Iowa stays Democratic. Indiana and North Carolina go back to their you know, normal um, state of voting, and then and then and then he, he picks up Florida as well. And because he's he, you know he's, because he picks up Florida um, in particular. And, the, and because now Colorado and Virginia are, are democratic, uh, the margin of victory for Obama in the, in the electoral college is, 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 really, is really substantial. All right, and then we get, this is where the rubber hits the road, okay? So in the, in the, in the electoral college game here, now notice here, this is really a stunningly red map. And, we, and it would still be stunningly red had the Democrats won Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, okay? This is where Trump surprised everyone. The Democrats keep Nevada, New Mexico, Colorado, and Virginia. Iowa becomes Republican. Ohio and Florida go 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 Republican. But the and and, and there's a you know a sizable victory for for Trump, um, and it, it's a sizable victory because he won Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. In order in with this electoral map, in order for Hillary Clinton to have won the election. Uh, had she won all three of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, she would have won the election. So looking at this map, and this is my, this is my vantage point, in terms of predicting what's going to happen in, 2000, in 2020, well, the Democrats can, can simply, and I say you know, simply as easier said than done, win Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, they win the election. They don't need, they don't need Florida, they don't need Ohio, they don't need North Carolina, they don't need Arizona. If they don't, and they need all three, if they, you know, two doesn't cut the mustard here. They've got to get all three. And if they can't get all three, they've got to make inroads in Arizona or North, North Carolina, Florida, and Florida, obviously, uh, as well. And then, you know, Iowa, Iowa would help. But New Hampshire now is, is pretty, pretty, pretty solidly uh, democratic. And, you know, what, what led me and, well, me and others to, to, to think in terms of this election being one for the Democrats to lose is that given what happened in 2018, where the Democrats did much better in, in, than they had, had early in 2016 in the Midwest states, they had a good chance of retaking Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. They also, however, have to hold Minnesota and New Hampshire, which Trump barely lost in, two, in, 2000, in 2016. And so that's why, that, that's why you know, Trump has, has, paid, has been spending, had spent a lot of time in Minnesota. And, and New Hampshire. And so this election is really coming down to those states where, where in, you know, in the current polls, Biden is, is ahead you know, on the order of four, maybe four to six points in these states. He's also ahead in Arizona and in North Carolina by a bit and also, and also Florida. So all of these states are in play. 
And, um, and you know, and, and just like I and others said about the, the 2016 election, the Democrats have sort of too many ways to win the Electoral College. But of course, the too many ways kind of crumbles because if, if, there, if there's any shift in the electorate, the shifts aren't going to occur state by state. They're, they're very, I think they may be likely to occur in sets of states, and uh, um, which, 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 which suggests the election, you know, you know if, it's, if it's not close, if it's not close, it could, it could be decisive in the direction of the Democrats or decisive in the direction of the, uh, of, 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 of the Republicans. In, ter in terms of the current polling, um, you know, a lot of a, a lot of a lot of Democrats, you know, Democrats are, are kind of scratching their heads a little bit, given some of the polls that that show Biden ahead by double digits nationally, and even occasional polls showing him ahead by double digits in initial states. And the big question is, well, you know, do the polls have the same problems that they had in 2016, where Trump support is is understated? And uh, um, um, some of us like to think not, in the sense that the, in, in the sense it's well known what the problems in the polls were. In the state, it's the state polls. The national polls in 2016 were fine. In the state polls, the, 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 um, the, the electorates that the state pollsters were estimating underestimated the size of the vote of white, whites without college degrees, particularly in the Midwest states. So all of the polls that you currently see, I would assume, if these pollsters are worth, you know, worth anything, are making adjustments for the, the proportion of the electorate that's, that's white, uh, voters without college degrees. And with those adjustments in place, the, you know, I would think the polls, the current polls are more accurate. On the other hand, uh, there, there's reason to believe that they're really inflated because there are a lot of Republicans and Trump supporters that aren't participating in the polls. And, and, and unless the pollsters are making adjustments for that, the, the polls could inflate um, Biden, Biden's current, current lead. And then the last thing I want to mention, we can talk about control of the House of Representatives and the Senate. The Democrats um, are, are in a position to take control of the Senate. There are a number of states that are, that are that, where they can pick up senators, Maine, Colorado, North Carolina. They may lose um, Alabama, but they can possibly pick up uh, Senate seats. And well, Arizona is in play um, um, as well, but there, but there are other states, including Iowa and others. We could, we could talk about that. So if, 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 if if, if the polls are right and Biden wins decisively, it's likely to be the case that uh, the Democrats will get control of the Senate as well. And then the last point I want to make, I'll just, I'll just make the, the usual debate and observation about the Electoral College. Uh, is, it, you know, is it bad for America? This is a book by a presidential scholar, George Edwards. Um, the, the Electoral College is in, in inherently uh, not democratic with a little d in terms of um, um, the president can win the election without a majority of the national vote, as we've seen, or even a you know, plurality of, of, of the national vote. And, uh, and this, this, you know, this, this, this debate will return once again if, if, if Trump wins the election, uh, winning the Electoral College and, and losing the national vote, which, which I think he's still likely to lose, uh, probably badly, but still be able to have a chance um, in the states. To, to change the um, Electoral College requires a constitutional amendment. That's not likely to happen. The only other way it could change is through um, con controversial legislation called the National Popular Vote Bill, which is a bill that state that that if the state passes it, uh, the state is committing to com is committing to commit its electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote, even if that winner doesn't win the state vote. Okay, that, that that's obviously you know controversial assertion, but that legislation will not take effect until enough states pass it so that um, the, the electoral votes of those states sum to 270, so that that will decisively determine that the president will win the, uh, the electoral college if he or she wins the um, popular vote. And I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, now we'll <clears throat> open up to uh, uh, questions from uh, the group. And remember, please uh, use the, uh, the raise your hand uh, button because uh, it's uh, difficult for me uh, to see everybody at the same time, so. The only way I'll know you're going to ask a question is through the uh, raise your hand. The first hand up is Lloyd. 
Dr. Shapiro, let me ask you a question, please. Uh, we haven't really talked about it. What effect does the COVID-19 pandemic have on the senator races? Because we all know that Republicans don't hold the Senate and Joe Biden wins the presidency, which seems to be the case. Uh, so I was just curious what your thoughts are on that matter. Yeah, I, 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 I think the connection will be, um, I, don't, I don't think it will be individual voters judging a senator based on the, um, the, the coronavirus. I think it'll be voters judging um, Donald Trump and then holding the rest of his party accountable um, for it. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is, you know, we, we can ask about the, the states to watch are Maine, Colorado, um, Arizona, and North Carolina. Those, those seems to be, seem to be the ones in, in play. And if we, you know, if we assume Alabama you know, is a state the Democrats are going to have trouble holding on to, Doug, Doug Jones, you know, it may, have been a, it may have been a fluke, it may not have been a fluke, we'll, we'll see. I don't think that I, I don't think, and you know, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong because I haven't followed this closely enough. I don't know if the, the virus in, in Maine, Colorado, um, Arizona, and North Carolina are, are, is, is is being debated in those states in terms of holding the senator the senator, you know, res responsible. I think it's holding the, the Trump and the Republican Party and the uh, the, the Republican uh, senator incumbent is is uh, you know is is in a position of guilt of guilt by association. By association, there, uh, but but I would say if, if the um, you know if the Democrats win you know with a huge majority of, of the national vote, that's likely to be reflected in the states, so that they'll win the electoral college. And if they do that, they'll be so I think there'll be coattails there for the, the, the Republican Republican senators in those states. But I think it's really tied to the national the national issue. Um, and in, in states that are being affected by the virus, a lot of those states are states with with, with Democratic. Um, incumbents that are in, that are in secure positions. That's a good question, Peter Fortman. Peter, uh, hello, Robert. I uh, noticed that Maine seemed to have split their electoral votes, and I guess the general rule is winner take all. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any more states going in that direction of splitting their electoral votes? Um, they. The, the, the states, the states and the state parties can decide how they want their electors to be selected. It just so happens that Maine has decided to, um, to, 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 to allow the electors to be allocated a combination of uh, a couple going to the candidate who wins the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the state, the state, the, the, the state vote. And then two of the two are allocated by whoever wins the congressional districts in the states. And um, the, the Nebraska does the same thing for I think I think three of their their districts as well. I, I haven't seen any move. I haven't seen any suggestions that other states are moving in that in that per, in that particular direction. Uh, but there, but there there are debates about what you know whether or not more states should be doing that and and, and, and they should be allotted not winner take all but 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 by congressional district. There's an there's an argument in favor of that. Thank you. Uh, in line with that. Uh... I don't know if there's any way to predict, but how would any of the uh, real close elections, you know, have turned out? Would they have come out the same, or would there be a difference because of, uh, you know, take take a state like New York, which is uh, probably as varied a state as you're going to get. Uh, you got the major uh, city areas, and uh, then you have the uh, upstate areas. Uh, the cities carried the state by and large, the upstate areas with uh, maybe as many, if not more, congressional districts uh, fell by the wayside because New York went in the, the direction of the cities. Would that have changed uh, any of these? Uh, yeah, yeah. It would. Yeah, it would. That's a that's a very good question. It would act, it would actually change where the where the candidates got their electors from. Obviously, that 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 is there would be, there would be a bunch of electors from New York that would that would that would you know, go Republican because because in those their congressional districts that are you know that are that are held by Republicans outside of the you know the downstate area. By the same token, of course, their districts in you know in in in, in well in, in California too the Republican areas there the, you know those sizable votes would be would be split electoral votes would be split but on but but on but on the other side you know throughout the South 
and all, and um, you know parts of the South, and particularly, particularly like in Florida and Texas, and so forth, where there are where, where there are still Democratic um, House members, the, the uh, you know presidential candidate would, would pick up electors chosen from those congressional districts. Uh, the, there have been studies done that have that have estimated how the elections would have would have would have would have turned out had all the states allocated their electors. Um, by, by congressional district. For the most part, throughout recent history, the, the, the end results would have been the same. But in a very close you know, election, um, it, 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 could, it, could go, it could go either way. It would, it would actually change the dynamic there pretty significantly. If, if that would Wouldn't that be a more equitable uh, yes. way to count the ballots? Because, you know, you're not being carried by one particular segment. Yes. I mean, right, Connecticut, uh, we know, would be uh, blue regardless. But uh... yeah, it, it, what's interesting about that? The, the argument in favor of that it would be it would be more equitable and democratic, um, and it would and it would also and it would also maintain the 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 founder, you know, the American founders' concern that the presidential candidate who wins the wins the election have have adequate geographic support, and that and that and that would that would move in that particular. Uh, direction as well, uh, but if, but if, and but for that to obviously for that to occur, the states would have to make changes state by state to do that, or there would have to be a constitutional amendment that that said you know, specifically that the electors would have to be allocated in that way. What the Constitution says, and this is this is a, this is a live issue now, particularly if there's a contested election, that we, as we've heard, all the Constitution says is that the electors are selected in whatever way the state legislature state legislatures determine. Uh, Larry. Uh, two questions. Number one, uh, voter turnout <clears throat> seems to be a very uh, major uh, determination of who's going to win the election, uh, both by mail and by uh, um, absentee ballots, as well as in-person voting. Uh, what do you think about changing the day of voting to a weekend day like a Saturday instead of having it on a Tuesday? And how would that uh, be accomplished? That's question one. Question two is uh, two uh, senators that uh, seem to be in trouble, one in major trouble, one in minor trouble are Lindsey Graham and uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, two of the major uh, Trump sycophants. Uh, what do you actually see in those two races? Okay, so, so, so the, the first the first question you know is, is a very good one, and um, a lot of uh, um, academics, a lot of philosophers, a lot of um, um, experts concerned with with democracy. Have argued that in order to increase just the idea of increasing voter turnout uh, requires that voting be made easier, and we've seen a movement in, in that direction. Uh, well, in terms of mail ballots, but also now we have early voting where people can vote on you know a day other than elect election day, um, and if, and of course other countries uh, and a lot of other countries, most other countries, election day is sort of a holiday, and it's not you know it's it's not it's not a it's not a Tuesday a work day. Um, the argument is, is is that election day should either be moved to the weekend or should or, or it should be made a holiday so that people have you know, a chance to vote. Well, the other kinds of things that could increase turnout, of course, would, would be to make voter registration easier. Uh, the ultimate uh, reform would be to, to make voter registration automatic so people don't have to worry about registering you know, to vote. And there are, way, there, there are different ways of making it, it automatic. So there, there, there have been lots of proposals and arguments in favor of, of, in favor of that. Uh, how to change it, it would, would, would require national legislation to do that. that that's, not, that's not fixed in the Constitution, that there's a, there's a law that, that, that determines that it's the um, uh, Tuesday after the first Monday. Uh, on your other question, I mean, um, you know, Lin Lindsey Graham is, is in, in, a, in, a, in a bit of a foot race here, and McConnell is potentially threatened, but, but I think less so. I think for them um, to win uh, the election, um, it would have to be related to, uh, you, know, you know, basically um, something close to a landslide victory for the Democrats in terms of the national vote, so that the uh, the Democratic vote carries over into the not only carries over into the states, 
but it, it gives Biden, as we call it, coattails in terms of these, uh, those elections. I mean, I mean there, there are a lot, you know, there's, there, there, there's strong opposition to, to Graham um, in, in his home state, but by the same token, there's a lot of strong support for him as well. Uh, related to to his support for Trump and 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 so forth, but 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 at this juncture, I mean, if if we, if, if the Democrats um, you know really win this this election big time, uh, you know, there's a there's a chance that Lindsey Graham and and Mitch McConnell will not be in the next Senate. That's a big if. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Um, my question is historically, how. And why did the uh, Electoral College be chosen to determine a president rather than a uh, popular vote? Yeah, there, 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 there are a couple. There are a couple things at work. Maybe three things that are worth that are that are that are, wor are worth highlighting. Uh, one thing, the, the one fundamental philosophical thing, is that the the American founders they were interested in having a democratic republic with. Um, you know, with, with democratically elected you know, representatives, uh, but they but, but they actually feared democracy and they feared the people, and they they wanted to build in barriers so that so that the 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 um, the ignorant man I'm going to overstate this the ignorant masses couldn't um, you know couldn't dominate politics um, the ignorant masses could, could 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 not be swayed by by some kind of pop, populistic political leader through manipulation. And, and so forth. That, 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 that is, they were really distrustful of the, of the people. Uh, the, um, the other feature of the, elect there are two other features of the Electoral College. One is, and this is part of the original debate, um, the Southern colonies were very concerned about the influence they would have in the, the first you know, American Republic after the Constitution was was ratified. They had their, the, um, that part of the United States had, had uh, smaller populations and they, they needed something to kind of beef up their um, influence in the government. That's, and, and that was one reason why we have the Senate automatically giving, uh, having two senators from each state, no matter what the population of this, the state is. Also, a lot of the South's population, uh, the, the South had a lot, of pop, a lot of people, but a lot of the people were, were black slaves. And the, the and and so the the, the South you know basically wanted those slaves to be counted. So we got the three fifths compromise that if each, each slave was counted as three fifths of a of a person. But in in doing that, uh, by beef, using that using that to beef up the population of, of the state, that basically in, increased the number of House members the state would get. And by virtue of that, it increased the number of electors to the electoral college that they would get. So that was another another characteristic. And then the last one is, and this is a philosophical one, um, and it, but, but it does speak to, to the South and, and some of the Western states' concerns. Uh, they, they, they were worried about, it, it was just the popular vote. It could be dominated by uh, the Northeast colonies. And they thought it was, it was a good idea for the president to have broad national geographic support so, so, so that all parts of the, of the country would, be, would, would have some input and influence in um, um, you know, on, on the president. So, so, so it's that it's that geographic component that you know it, it's kind of it's, it's kind of persuasive philosophically. There, put aside the fear of democracy, put put aside the southerners, so the South and slavery, which is a, which is a whole other other concern other concern there. And then in, in terms of in, and in terms of making in terms of making the case for the electoral college today, it's very difficult to do because you know the, the country has become more democratic with a little d. Back in the days of the colonies, it was it was thought that the voters would be basically white ma white males with property, but now but now and, and then the Senate was not was was elect, was selected by the state, you know by the, the state legislatures. It was only with the Seventeenth Amendment that we vote, that voters voted directly for the Senate. The only office that voters voted for directly was the House of Representatives, and then of course their own state um, legislatures and. And, and governors, but but then the electorate the electorate was expanded. I mean, and you know, the expansion of the electorate to include women, uh, uh, vote, voters, um, um, eighteen who were eighteen year olds, eighteen years old and older, and also you know African Americans who were you know who were disenfranchised. So the case for the elect so because of this move in a democratic direction, Democrat with a little D, you know, it seems fitting to make the 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 election of the president more democratic by. Um, Electing the president directly, rather than buffered by the uh, by the electoral college. 
that is the fear of the people has sort of dissipated. Uh, or, or, or well, or maybe you know, or maybe, or, or, or maybe it hasn't. The only, you know, the only, the only one argument offered, and th this is the one I find most compelling for the electoral colleges. If there's if there's a close election, and there's issues of needing to recount the vote, um, the recount would not have to occur nationally. It would ha only have to occur in states where um, wh where there might be some con contestation of the vote. So it would be sort of simpler. To do a recount. But as we saw in 2000, doing a recount of a state, even one state is not so easy. And then by the same token, in principle, it should be easy to do a recount. You know, it's easy to do a recount nationally it is, is, as it is to do a recount in any one state. But again, here we're, we're talking about something that's, that's very difficult and it could become, you know, it could become a big issue in the, in, in the current election. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Cole. Yes, uh, particularly the, uh, the left has its hair on fire about uh, contested elections and a non-transfer uh, of power under the Constitution. How realistic do any of these fears seem to you? Um, well, the, I, I think, the, I think the real, real fear has to do with uh, debates about the counting, the counting of votes in states uh, having to do with, you know, I, I think everybody would like to have a free and fair election here. In fact, in fact, I would argue the United States needs to show the world that it can have a free and fair election. We're, we're now going to have, you know, Jimmy Carter is going to send electoral observers to the United States. Okay, this, this is and 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 and, and there, there are calls worldwide for observers to be sent to the United States in the in the, in the, in the current election. Uh, I think the re I think the real problem is is going to be in in the, in the in the counting of votes, and agree and it's particularly agreeing to count votes, mail-in votes that come in after election day. Um, and that's, and that, that's where there'll be, there'll, there'll, there'll be some con contestation there. The, um, uh, in, in the, uh, and, and that's, that's where we really, that's where we really have to, especially with, with the president and Republicans claiming that this is gonna be a fraudulent election, uh, you know, if, if, he, if, 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 he, if he loses. Um, the, in the debate last night, there was a, there was a question that was asked that, that, that uh, if, Kamala Harris, I think, I think Kamala Harris ducked it, or ducked it, or they, they both ducked a lot of questions, obviously. But the one question I don't think they should have ducked is the question is, well, what, you know, what if the president doesn't agree to vacate the White House? That is, and I was assuming the question asked, well, what if, what if the, uh, the electoral vote was counted, Congress accepted it and certified it, bought it and declared that the winner was Joe Biden. And then at that point, there was a problem with transfer of power that, you know, with Trump not leaving not leaving and acknowledging. Well, at that point, once the electoral vote is certified by, you know, by, by, by Congress, on, and that's the new Congress, not the old Congress, on January 20th, the new president gets sworn in. So Joe Biden will, you know, will find somebody, to, somebody will come forth to swear him in, Chief Ju Justice Roberts or, or someone else. At that point, he becomes president of the United States, at which point he, he can command the Secret Service, to escort Donald Trump out of the White House. That is, escort Donald Trump along with his Secret Service contingent that he has as an ex-president. That seems pretty straightforward and, and simple to me. The bigger problem is in the counting, is, is, is getting to the point where Congress certifies the electoral vote, it means that the votes, are, the votes are counted, the state electors meet and they, they count the vote, the votes and, and state legislatures agree that the vote should be transmitted to um, the uh, Congress, um, you know, basically by the end of the end, the end of December, and uh, and and that that's those are the difficult stages that are that, that are in, that would come into play that are of that if anything's going to be of concern to to anybody, the left included, that's what should be of concern. Once once the electors are once it's agreed upon who won the electoral vote, that's it, that it's over. Roman. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, my question is uh, two parts. You talked about polarization of Democratic and uh, Republican Party. What is that a result of uh, a population por 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 polarization, electorate, or, or vice versa? Electorate got por polarized because parties got polarized. And second part, is when is this the current phenomenon that uh, parties 
try to gain electorate by only accusing opponents without even uh, getting their own plans forward. And then probably this repealing of Affordable Care Act is, is the best, you know. Uh, Republicans say that it's bad, bad plan, but they don't have their own plan. And when when electorate started believing and, and looking only on, uh, on the criticism, not at, at the real, what what are you going to do for me? Things. Good. Okay. Well, well th th those are two two really two two very good questions. Okay. The first the first question is 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 really a political science question. This is the kind of thing political scientists like to like to think about. Um, do we have this current state of polarization because political leaders have been responding to a po ideologically polarized electorate or public, or is the case that the, the electorates become polarized or ideological and diver ideologically divergent because political leaders have become divergent? The, uh, the, 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 I would argue, and there's, stu there's studies that show this, this kind of stuff, the, 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 the change first occurred visibly among the level of, at the level of political leaders. That is the, the behavior of, of members of Congress and the Senate becoming more polarized in terms of, of, their, of, their, of their voting. That is those leaders becoming more, more consistently, Republicans becoming more consistently conservative on, on almost everything, Democrats more consistently liberal. And that's kind of penetrated down to the, to the electorate who, take, who basically are led by the leaders or take their cues you know, from the leaders. That is, that is the, the public and the voters don't have a lot of time to, to study politics and issues, and, and, they're, and they're really looking for the leaders for guidance, which is, which is a good thing. I mean, we can't talk about democracy without talking about leadership, and especially positive leadership. And the, and, and the leaders have defensible, you know, have, have defensible positions on policy and have reasons for why they take their position. So, 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 that, so that the first stage was that it hurt, occurred among leaders and the voters came along but then, and this is this is this is the real compelling part about your question. Now it's the case that the electorates have become, you know, basically firmly entrenched, and you know, differing in their in their views on issues. So that if political leaders want to moderate their positions, they risk being you know not being reelected because they're diverging from positions of their voters, which the leaders originally helped create. So that that's sort of a more complex answer to your your question. In, ter in terms of the second, the second question, um, could, could, you re could you just rephrase that, 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 that second question again? I just want to get it right. Uh, second question was when electorate started only looking and believing uh, with the criticism of, of opponents, not really looking at the uh, platform you know, what, what politicians are proposing. And, and I gave this example of our Affordable Care Act that Republicans are saying that it's bad plan, but they don't have their own plan. What, what are you going to replace with? So, and, and there are many issues, you know, in similar situation. Yeah, okay. That, okay, that's, that, that turns out to be another political science question as well. So, and and I, I keep talking about political science a little as if it differs from politics. A lot of political science doesn't, you know, doesn't focus very heavily on real world politics, but this is, this is one case where it does. The, uh, you, you would think that these differences among voters have to do with basically debates and differences on policy issues like the, like the, like the, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and so one argument is that current politics is so, you know, so vicious, so to speak, because they're really, they're real strong differences on, on policy issues. And it matters for Democrats that the Democratic leaders have a you know, have Obamacare and, and Biden has a plan, and 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 for Republicans they don't like you know they they they, they oppose it. Uh, it would be nice if Republicans had an alternative plan that the, that 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 could be debated and focused on as well. The competing argument is that the the, the differences aren't related to policy, but 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 basically you have two different groups that are at at the, at, at even a personal level dislike each other. And political, the, the kind of language that's, that's been used, you may have heard about this. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, party, the, the Democrats and Republicans being associated with certain social groups and, you know, tribes. We're talking about tribal influences here that, 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 that have, have, have 
different have differences in worldviews, but differences in terms of the kinds of people who support you know support the um, su support the parties. And polls actually show there are data that show that you know, when, when Democrats and Republicans are asked about how they feel toward toward people in the other party, they show genuine you know emotional dislike at a, at, at almost at a, at a at a at a personal kind of level. And that's a that's that's a different kind of conflict than one than one that really is focused on, fo focusing on the kind of the rational aspects of differences on concrete uh, policy issues. So, so, so I would argue that we, we, we basically see both things going on here. But in, in, in terms of you know, Trump's base of support, I mean, for Trump's base of support, um, there's a policy component to it, but, but a, lot of, you know, a lot of Trump's policies don't necessarily benefit uh, his base directly. One could argue that his economic policies has, haven't helped them as much as it should. On the other hand, they would argue, a certain big chunk of his base would argue that his judicial appointments have mattered a lot. And, and that really that really drives things pretty um, pretty substantially. But but for a lot of Trump's base of support, it's basically it may not be so much they like you know his policies or even him, but they really oppose the opposition at a deep emotional level. And they'll, and it's, and their support for him has to has to do with the fact that they think the, the other guys are worse, so to speak. Now, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that was my interpretation. Well, thank you, Larry. Um, Following up on Roman's uh, one of Roman's points and the early part of your uh, discussion, seems to me that the uh, great divide occurred with the rise of the Tea Party. But the, the Tea Party's philosophy, as I understood it at the time, was smaller government and you know, get the government out of my life. But what's happened actually is the government is has gotten bigger and things have been done mostly through the executive branch by executive orders rather than through uh, legislation. And do you agree with uh, that point? And do you agree that the Tea Party's um, existence was mostly the cause of this uh, tremendous bipartisan, um, anti-bipartisanship. Yeah, I, I, think, I think your point about the, 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 tea, the tea Party um, emerged um, in, in, in response to the uh, basically Obama administration and, and its policies. For, the, for them, you know, the Health Affordable Care Act was a, was a big deal. Uh, they're associated with, op, you know, with, with opposition to big government, opposition to budget deficits, and things that you know, think and, and support for lower taxes and, and things of that sort. Um, I, I I think there's a there's a good case can be made that the roots of Trump's support uh, have have come from the you know have come from have came from the Tea Party originally. That a lot of his base are are from people who are supportive of the of the Tea Party. Now, obviously, the Trump administration has not followed through on you know small government um, protecting you know balancing the budget and and that, and that and that kind of thing. It has come through with, with you know, tax, tax reform that would lower taxes, also, also deregulation. But the one cost of that has been a, you know, a, basically a rising budget deficit. So the, the, but the rationalization from the, from the Tea Party wing of the party, so to speak, is, is that um, they're willing to accept that because their, under, their understanding is, their perception is, and it's probably right, that if, um, the, the, you know, as, the, as much as Trump has fallen short, the Democrats would have been worse, or would be worse, and it's really a comparison between uh, the two parties and the two candidates. Um, you know that, that 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 matters the most here. So the concerns you, you raise, I think, are, are still you know are still alive and well. Uh, I got a question, or it's a, an observation, and I, I don't know how to express it, but it it seems that the the two parties now, uh, where they worked together uh, back years ago, uh, and uh, it wasn't a sin to cross party lines uh, if a, a representative felt strongly about something. Where today, is, is it something that I, I just feel that the 
parties now are just syncopants. Whatever the party leader, whatever Pelosi says or McConnell says, every Democrat is going to vote that way and every Republican is going to vote that way. And regardless of how they actually feel about a certain subject. Uh, and uh, I mean, that and, and, and the other thing kind of touched on what Larry said uh, about the president, you know, the, the administration uh, making the policies, uh, it seems like Congress themselves have given up uh, their uh, obligation to create the policies and they're leaving it to the administration to create the policies. Yeah, okay, that, that's a very good point. Now, in, ter in terms of the ability of the, of the parties to work together for, um, you know, leaders in both parties to kind of cross party lines there. Um, it's not happening because for the most part, um, the, the senators and, and house members that we have are, are predominantly um, not moderates of, of kind of the old school, that, of the old school that, that Joe Biden laments about and is convinced he could still you know, find rep Republicans to work with. Um, I think in principle, that's a good idea, assuming that there are members of the other party who are, who, you know, who would be willing to, would be, be willing to work with you, you know, politically and ideologically. But the parties have become just simply more homogeneous. Uh, you know, Democrats, more, more consistent liberals who aren't going to cross over, and uh, Republicans, more consistently conservative. That is, there, there are just fewer uh, members of the House and the Senate that, that, that fit the mold. Of, of those that would that, that would cross you know that that would in fact be you know workable across across party lines. Now the, the, the now the big question is of course is are there issues on the table that real that that are so dire that it would that it would really persuade uh, members of the House and the Senate who are normally so ideologically different that they see that they need to you know to to work together. And I and, and I think to, just to show you how bad things are. Um, the fact that we don't have a new stimulus bill at the moment is just extraordinary because in conservative policy circles associated with conservative economists, including the two leaders, Powell and uh, uh, Richard Clarida, who's actually a colleague of mine at Columbia, who head the Federal Reserve, these are conservative economists. And they're saying, they're saying, They've done all they could. The Fed's done all it could, and they and they what they need is they, they need basically more liberal fiscal policy. They need a government. They need a stimulus bill to deal with the economy in tandem with the virus. That is the the the, the argument among the conservative economists is that we've got to deal with the virus before we in, in order to turn around the economy. And despite that, that gives Republican leaders an out to basically go along. Over, you know, in the short term, and 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 Donald Trump, who would benefit from showing he's trying to turn around the economy with a stimulus bill, but the parties are are so entrenched in in certain ways that even on an issue that kind of you know begs for bipartisanship, where where if there were bipartisan activity, there would be broad national support for it among Republicans and Democrats in the electorate. That just shows you how difficult things are. Uh, all right, we got the last, uh, Ar Arcady, you got, you checked something, but uh, are you want, yeah, wanting yeah, to I ask do, a question? I, I do have a question. Okay. Uh, there is a statistics that 95% uh, of journalists and reporters vote uh, Democratics and majority of media also on Democratic side. So is a danger that the United States transform itself into one party dominated system and will become uh, not, a, uh, not a democracy, but a one party dominated country? Yeah, well, in, in, in terms of, of, of the country becoming uh, dominated by, by one party, I think that's unlikely given, just given the current ideological divisions in the United States at the level of voters and at the level of political leaders. Now, the point about journalists, and you can, you can talk about college professors too and, and, and other kind of elite kind of occupations where the, those individuals tend to be more, you know, tend, tend to vote more, more democratically. I mean, that, that, that's, well, that, that's um, kind of an observable fact 
But the big question about the journalist is to what extent does that, does that affect you know, their, um, you know, their behavior? That is, to what, to what extent do conservative journalists report the news straight? To what extent do liberal journalists, as you pointed out, report the news straight? And I, and I, 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 I think the, I think there, 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 there are two incentives that journalists have that, that are very important. There's one huge bias among journalists. Journal, journalists and the press, the media, they want audiences. So they have an incentive to offer their audiences things they're interested in so they can sell, they can sell subscriptions, they can sell advertising. This is a business. So the, so, so the bias in the press and the media is a bias, not liberal or conservative, it's a bias to conflict. Conflict sells. And so they, they have an incentive to magnify and even provoke conflict if they, if they can. Secondly, journalists have also have an incentive to kind of get things right. So, so, so that, you know, if we, if we talk about, you know, journalism, the big question is, well, to, to what extent does the ideological slant of the Wall Street Journal affect how its reporters report straight news? And, there, and you know, there's a difference between the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the editorial page. Uh, there, there are good journalists at um, Wall Street News. They're also good journalists at Fox News when they're reporting the news. And also Fox News does political polling, but the, and their polling is, is, is not biased. Their polls are just like, they're as good or bad as any other polls. Um, by the same token as well, could you, can, you, can, you, can you ask the same thing and come up with the same answer you know, for, the, uh, uh, for the New York Times in terms of reporting of the straight news versus the editorial page? So, so I think the prospects for part, one party domination are not gonna come from the press, it's gonna come from real politics, political leaders, and voters. And I think, conf I, think, I think conflict and more than one party is here to stay. The big question is, you know, what's gonna happen with the parties? Because the parties are divided in certain ways. Democrats, you know, are potentially divided. And the outcome of the election could affect the nature of the party system. What, what, will, happen to, what will happen to the Republican party if, if Trump loses? What will happen to the Democratic party if Biden loses? Thank you. It, it's an evolution. Like, you know, years ago, you had the liberal, conservative, Democrat and Republican parties and the liberal and conservative parties disappeared as parties, but they become the Democrat and Republican parties. So, uh, Joe, uh, we're just going to take now Joe Racanello and Franco and that's, uh, we'll end the question if you don't mind two more sure. questions. <laughs> Thank you. Joe. We can't hear him. Uh, he just checked himself out. Oh, okay. Uh, Franco, last question. Unmute yourself, Franco. No, Dr. Shapiro, thank you for this presentation. Uh, in the last four years, probably before the four years, we have assisted the, what I call the, the creation of the block, ideological blocks. They are in an impasse, basically, now. More time passed, and if you are going to have another four years of this ideological block where legislation cannot be debated, or, and uh, one is uh, better than the others. There is a risk, in my view, to a prelude like happened in uh, 30 in Germany or in Italy, where the two parts they couldn't do anything, and a dictator or somebody with a strong military view or ego will come and uh, say, okay, we'll do my own way. But are we in the road to create a new Putin with a uh, blonde hair? Well, the, 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 the kind of concern you raise has actually come up in the context of, of, of Donald Trump as being potentially that kind of, you know, that, that kind of leader. The, the, way, the way it currently looks in the United States though, and, and this is for better or for worse, um, We've, we've had in recent years a, a greater proportion of unified Republican or Democratic governments than we've, than we've had before, which has enabled those governments to do things. I mean, Obama was able to, you know, you know, to, to pass things. Trump was able to pass things because he had, you know, majorities in, in the House and the Senate. Uh, the, 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 so I, and if the, if the issue comes up of the next administration not being able to get his, his legislation passed through Congress. It makes a difference whether or not it's the context of 
that leader having unified control of the, of the Senate and, and, and the House. Um, Trump has been able to do, you know, basically most of what he's wanted to do, because a lot of what he's wanted to do has been judicial appointments where, that only require a majority vote. Also, he was able to get tax reform through because he's able to use budget. He's able to use a process that's not affected by the filibuster that could occur in the, um, in, in the Senate. If Biden were elected and he's trying to get things done and he has, he has a majority support from the Senate and majority support from the House, and he's not able to pass legislation because Republicans in the Senate are filibustering. Uh, what could happen at that point is that they could change the rules and end the filibuster. And that would, that would enable the Biden administration to pass with majority votes any policy that he, that he wants. So I, I, th I, think that, I think the possibilities of, you know, of what we call gridlock are there but, but there are ways around it. The, the cost would be changing the rules in the Senate in a way that would be you know, changing uh, political norms of a sort that the Democrats have criticized the Republicans uh, for. But I think, that, I think that the chance of a rise of a, you know, a, a military populist kind of leader, um, uh, I, well, I think is less likely in the United States. And a lot of it has to do with um, the debates about civil military relations in the United States. And up until now, the military has steered clear of politics. And I think that's significant in the context of, of uh, what you've asked about. Thank you. Dr. Shapiro, thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, you were able to apoliticize a very political <laughs> subject. Uh, it was informative and I, uh, Really appreciate you giving us your time today. Uh, and, and Carl, thank you for having your brother uh, present to us. Okay, well, th well thank, thank you. I, I enjoyed the session very much. Uh, likewise. Bye-bye. Okay, Great job, Bob. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, doctor. Bye-bye. Okay, if does anybody have any uh, comment or, or, or thing otherwise we will